We live in a world crafted by the tenets of liberalism. Western societies of all hues broadly base their politics, laws and thinking around this very idea. Inevitably, Muslims have been impacted by liberalism, not least because after the fall of the Ottoman Caliphate, the Muslim world became subject to a liberal intellectual inquisition. Today many of us cannot see the tradition except through a liberal lens. This is most pronounced with Muslims living in Western societies. Yet liberalism is also on the retreat the world over. Some of its basic dogmas are today being questioned not only by Muslims but also by Americans and Europeans. A successive series of crises has called to question capitalism, liberal democracy, equality and freedom. We at The Thinking Muslim over the coming episodes will explore liberalism from a number of angles. We have lined up some very interesting guests, some who are ardent proponents of the liberal ideals. I have interviewed the self-professed American Muslim liberal Shadi Hamid. We have a very important discussion between the New York Times journalist Mustafa Akyol and Dr. Obermeer Anjum and other guests will contribute to unpacking and understanding how Muslims should navigate these issues. As some of you may know, I have hosted a number of courses exploring Islam and liberalism, partly because I have found many Muslim critics tend to skim the surface of these ideas, or their criticism appeals to those that already subscribe to their worldview. We at The Thinking Muslim want to move beyond our echo chambers, and in the process our confidence in Islam should enable us to dissect and if necessary critique with intelligence, ideas that look to remove Islam and its energy from our lives. This week I have probably one of the most learned authorities on the subject. Professor Joseph Kaminsky from the University of Sarajevo has recently published a really important academic work on the subject titled Islam, Liberalism and Ontology. The link to the book is available in the show notes. I spoke to him in April. He argues in his book that Islam is incompatible with many of the fundamental premises of liberalism. He also argues that Islam should not be coined in opposition to liberalism, such that we reduce Islamic values to be anti-everything liberalism may stand for. Our faith may sometimes share some values of other ideas, but the Creator sets out clear parameters and limits. These ideas will be explored in the podcast. As always, we hope you can continue the discussion on our website by commenting below the show notes. Do remember to forward this podcast to others and we would very much appreciate a review on Apple Podcasts. This will help us in the podcast rankings. So Professor Kaminsky, what gave you the idea about the book and uh, why did you feel you needed to write about Islam and liberalism? One of the things I want to point out here in this book too, I, I, I don't want people reading this to think that this is some you know, diatribe about how evil liberalism is. Because I, I know that's what some people are looking for, the red meat, right? But we know, I'm not going to mention any names, but we know some people that love to jump on this. Liberalism is pure evil and, you know, everything is so bad about it. It's like the, the jowl, is, liberalism is the jowl, the jowl is liberalism. And, you know, that's not what I'm trying to do at all here. I'm really trying to offer a technical analysis of the broader discourse of Islam and liberalism. And the show where and where they are not compatible. And I'm, my basic argument is at a higher order level, there's some serious incompatibilities that need to be taken because my more general claim is if you try to organize a society around shaky foundations, you're gonna end up, it's gonna end up imploding upon itself. It's, it's more, just the book is meant more as like a, a warning, sort of like, it's, not, it's written in a way that I want people to consider the potential dangers of trying to put a, a liberal social order in an Islamic society because the point of this book is there's just so many things that are not conducive to that. And this is why I, I quoted Bernard Lewis at the beginning, somebody who I do not like in general. And I also quote Sam Huntington, another person who I'm not a big fan of overall, but he does make a couple important points. And Lewis's point that I wanted to highlight is, you know, no matter how far it's traveled, liberalism is a product of enlightenment Western thought for the most part, the way we understand it today at least, right? This isn't to suggest that there's no you know, proto-liberal ideas that existed elsewhere before the Enlightenment, but the discourse of liberalism as we understand it today and liberal democracy is a Western phenomenon. And when you implement it on other societies that don't have those social political prerequisites, and there's so many that I don't have time to talk about all that right now, you can just read Alexis de Tocqueville, 
for some uh, discussions about the uniqueness of America and why it was what it was and why other countries can't really ever hope to beat it. There's nothing radically new here. But the point is, is that, you know, people in recent times have tried to sort of find more of these congruencies between these two discourses. So are, are you saying that there are some overlaps between uh, Islam and liberalism? And indeed, there are some. There's, there's no reason to think there's not. But at the same time, we don't have to understand things like rationality, freedom, um, and all these other things that are emphasized within standard liberal idioms through a liberal framework, because within Islam, these things exist in their own terms as well. You know, these ideas are not completely alien to Islam. And it seems like the problem is people, you know, if you're a liberal, you support freedom of thought, freedom of consciousness. And if you're a Muslim, that means you're against it. And this is this is not my understanding of Islam, at least. And I don't think most Muslims see it like this. So this book is not meant to be a rant against liberalism. I would argue that liberalism is in many ways the best alternative to a properly functioning Islamic order. Because certainly what China's doing is not something anybody wants to see. And I don't think anybody wants Russia's model. And let's be honest, there's some there's some Islamic models right now, such as we see in Iran and Saudi Arabia, that I don't think most Muslims want either, right? So I'm not trying to say that liberalism is something horrible. I mean, just let's be honest, American Muslims have it much better than the vast majority of Muslims in any other part of the world. And the same for British Muslims, to be honest. Like, there's a lot of people suffering a lot more than in these societies. So we can't just say that liberalism equals bad. But what I'm trying to say is when we really start looking deeply at what these discourses are about, what they center on, what they focus on, what their emphasis is upon, how their understanding of the world is situated, and then we do see that there are some significant differences that must be accounted for, and that perhaps we should look in other directions if we're going to try to uh, create, you know, models of social order that uh, are going to be more conducive to an Islamic mindset and to an Islamic society. Because one of the points I make throughout my book is that the imposition of liberalism by outside forces upon the Muslim world have ended in disaster and, and, and tragedy. To be I would like to take you back to the beginning of your of your book. So you. Uh, you cite a discussion, a Cato roundtable event between Shadi Hamid and Mustafa Akio. Now, Mustafa Akio, as we know, is a, a New York Times journalist and a best-selling writer. And, and um, he argues that uh, there is a, a, a compatibility between Islam and liberalism. And, and in fact, he's calling for uh, some form of reformation within modern Islam to uh, to co coexist uh, more entirely with uh, with liberal principles. Um, but you took some, uh, some, uh, you know, you, uh, you took some interesting, you, you drew some interesting conclusions from that meeting between the two. Um, can you describe the meeting and and why you felt even Shadi Hamid's argument, which which was essentially your argument that Islam and liberalism are incompatible, why you still felt that Shadi Hamid's argument needed uh, developing? So the, the roundtable discussion was sort of about. Um... You know, this idea of, like, can we see some kind of liberal Islam emerge anytime soon? And Akil, who sort of made a career on trying to make an argument that this is a reasonable thing to, to hope for, you know, his argument really does hinge upon reformation. And, he, and he'll admit that. Like, I've had a couple brief interactions with him online, and uh, you know, he made a very nice, you know, passing compliment towards the idea of my book. I'm sure he hasn't read it yet because it hasn't even officially come out, but he thinks it's an important idea. <clears throat> and he sort of admitted that, yes, my whole premises on reformation and he in, in his talk he references jewish enlightenment the haskalah he mentions moses mendelssohn and he talks about uh social prerequisites and all these things that can happen that will help allow for more liberal interpretations of islam to come in and then we can see like a more compatibility with islam and liberalism so he thinks it's, it's feasible but he will admit that it's not feasible within the traditional muslim orientation so the the mainstream you know, Muslim who you meet at the masjid who reads, you know, the classic scholars and whatnot probably would uh, have take issue with his claims. And he's arguing sort of that these ideas need to change. They need to change with the liberal times. So that's what his whole his whole thing has been. And he has another book coming out that sort of uh, I, I don't exactly know what the title is, but it sort of engages with this exact discussion. Maybe you know the title. Yeah, reopening Muslim minds. I would like to read it because I think it's going to be interesting to check out. But I think once again, even in that book, it, it's it's a collection of arguments made by people that are not seen as within the mainstream of the discourse. It's by reformists and other people who historically have been sort of not accepted as uh, you know mainstream sources of Islamic knowledge. And that's a you know that that's 
you know, an interesting way to frame it, but I, I don't think you can sort of do that. I, I really think that it's hard to change the minds of the mass majority of 1.2 billion people to accept sort of positions that have sort of been even rejected during their own times. Like, I don't know how they're going to come back into fashion when, when they were never really that fashionable themselves. As for Shadi Hamid's argument, he sort of openly admits that he's more skeptical of the possibilities of uh, Islamic liberalism taking place anytime soon. He talks about people not wanting to risk their spiritual well-being to embrace liberal or non-traditional positions. And I think he's right on that. I think that is the more accurate assessment. I think most people aren't willing to embrace gay marriage and other things that are socially now becoming more and more hot button issues. <clears throat> I don't think most Muslims are going to want to sit on the sideline as demeaning images of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, are drawn and shown in classrooms, and there's absolutely no repercussions. Like, I just don't think, yeah, of course, I think the vast majority of Muslims don't want to see the terrible tragedies that have happened in France play out in other places, because, like, that's, you know, nobody's allowed in Islam to take justice into their hands as a vigilante. We all know this. But at the same time, I don't think most Muslims are going to want to say, well, you know what, freedom of speech, we've got to deal with it. Like, that's not how it works. And I think, once again, even with an Islamic discourse, and this is one of the reasons why I argue this, there's some serious incompatibilities, is that there are going to be limits on free speech. There are going to be limits on freedoms. There are going to be certain things in an Islamic society you simply can't do that are simply unacceptable. And like, that's a tough pill to swallow in, in a world that is dominated by the, the social norms of secular liberalism. This is something that you have to accept. And this is tough to explain to people because it's, it's all about trying to find a way to square the circle. But sometimes you have to just say, it's just not going to happen unless you reform the entire religion, unless you do what Akil seeks to do. And this is what Akil is saying should be done. And I'm arguing sort of that it shouldn't be done because it goes against my understanding of Islam. And I also don't think it's reasonable or feasible. I think it'll just lead to more backlash, more extremism, and more violence. Like, I don't see that as a solution. And what about Shadi Hamid? So Hamid sort of makes a point that I thought was sort of interesting, though, talking about within Sharia that, you know, a punitive dimension is sort of an element that is intrinsic to the understanding of law within Islam. Now, I'm not an Islamic legal expert, so I can't go into too much detail about how accurate that assumption is, but it seems to be relatively true. There is sort of a, a, a retributive element of justice within Sharia, you know, eye for an eye and some, you know, whatnot. And, um, you know, I, I think that that's a point that he says makes it, is, is differs from the function of liberal law and the idea of what the, the function of law is, is to rehabilitate without any real emphasis on the punitive dimension. And he says, and, and, you know, I, once again, this is a talk that other scholars can have probably far more competently than me. But he, this is a, this is the kind of thing my book is engaging with. These are the higher order problems to make reconciling these discourses problematic. And I think there's a lot of examples like this, where there's certain understandings of what the function of certain things are. What is the function of law? What are the function of rights? Why do we have rights? Who are the rights for? And all of these things, I think, are where liberalism and Islam differs. Can, can I ask you to go to... First principles, I mean, what is in your mind liberalism? How, how would you define liberalism? Well, I mean, <clears throat> liberalism itself is, is a disposition at some level, right? Uh, as I note in my book, Andrew March uh, argues a comprehensive liberalism. So we have to understand liberalism is there's two different dimensions I'm talking about. Enlightenment liberalism, what we call comprehensive liberalism, and then the, the Rawlsian political liberalism, which is meant to be more constrained, right? So when we're talking about liberalism, right now we're talking about the big L, if you want to put it that way, right? The comprehensive doctrine. March argues it is a way of life, it is a theory of value, and it's an epistemology, and that specifically its followers value rational autonomy, critical scrutiny of tradition, skepticism, and experimentation. Though it's not clear what the order of these actually are, if you have to rank them, right? Furthermore, it's perhaps even more relevant for our purposes, and I mentioned this in my book specifically, comprehensive liberalism offers truth claims for these values and do not seek to disguise their incompatibility with ways of life that are uh, based on heteronomious difference to established authority, right? So we see here that liberalism is, and at least I argue, it's about freedom. It's about expanding the sphere of freedom. And it's about laws made by man for man. It's about the dunyawi. It's about this world. And it's about creating a society which maximizes overall success and pleasure and happiness in this world. It's not worried about gods or God or whatever after you die, right? It's, it's a purely worldly phenomenon, hence the, uh, the direct link between secularism and liberalism. They are very hard to decouple from each other. 
Uh, some scholars have argued that, you know, the, Christ, the liberalism actually developed out of, of Christianity and secularism emerged from it as well. And that's an argument I sort of talk about a little bit in my book. But, uh, you know, in general, though, liberalism is about maximizing freedom. And it's about these things that Marge talks about. It's about autonomy, critical, critical scrutiny of tradition, and skepticism, right? And Islam is really not about that. You know, rational autonomy is important. But once again, there's sort of the, an underlying presence of the Quran, the Sunnah, the Sharia, and the tradition, right? You know, when we talk about what modernity is, and I have a quote that I really like to discuss about whenever I teach about what is modernity, basically it's the Nicholas Compritas quote that I referenced at the beginning of the book. And basically it's this ability to look into the future without having to look back at the past. Being able to untether yourself from the past, to look forward uh, with a break, the possibility of a complete break with the past, looking at a new future that is separate from, to, from yesterday, right? I, I, I sort of made that far less eloquent than Capritus wrote, but that's the basic idea. The potential for looking forward without having to depend on the past and the potentiality for a complete break with the past. Past is over, we are now in a new age. That can't be done in any religious tradition that I know of because all religions look back at certain prophetic figures, important foundational figures, and sp specific, usually uh, some kind of sacred text, practices and rituals that emerge from or out of those formative years of the religion, right? So you can't have an Islam that cuts the past because that would mean getting rid of the Quran and the Sunnah itself, and that's not going to work. So when we look at some of these things, skepticism as well, as well, like, you know, there are certain things within Islam you just have to sort of believe, even if you don't know the answer to it, right? So while there is skepticism of certain things, there's certain things also that you just, as a Muslim, you are obliged to accept and to believe blindly, if you want to put it that way, right? And there's, other, of course, there's like reasons to believe this stuff. So it's not just, you know, total blind obedience, right? But at the same time, there are certain things you're supposed to just say, we accept that we don't know the answer and Allahu Alam, right? And that's something that uh, I don't think um, you can really have an Islam that rejects that. There's certain foundational things that you just got to accept to be Muslim. And finally, when it comes to experimentation, you know, Muslims themselves obviously have our, you know, some of the main creators of science, the modern scientific revolution that happened in the West, obviously began prior in, in the Muslim world. There's all kinds of stuff that talks about this. You can find all that stuff online. But, um, you know, once again, experimentation with the dean itself, experimentation with the methods and the sources of law, the sources of the tradition is something that, as Shadi Hamid says, most Muslims aren't comfortable in engaging in, right? So all of these things at a foundational level sort of put li liberalism and Islam sort of at odds with each other, right? So what I'm trying to argue in the book is that like, um, and finally the last part March says here is that it doesn't seek to disguise its incompatibility with the ways of life based on deference to established authority. And, and let's be honest, that's what Islam in its core is all about, obeying the Sharia, obeying the Quranic demand, the, the creeds of the Quran. Is it not? So like Islam is based on sort of deference to established authority. Now, which whose authority, which authority, that's a question we can debate. But, you know, I think all of us would agree at the core who practice Islam and take it seriously that, you know, our obedience is ultimately to Allah and his book and his messenger. So this is some, these are some big things here. And uh, I think that's something that we have to think about when we talk about what the Islamic approach to the world is, the Islamic approach to life is. And it's very different than the secular liberals approach to life because of things that are valued. Right? Secular liberalism is based on a sort of model of rationality that's very the, the economic rationality that we see in neoliberal and liberal economic thinkers, right? Maximizing utility, all this stuff. And, you know, for a Muslim, there's more to life than just maximizing profits because certain uh, financial gains are haram, right? And certain practice, and if you value your, the, the akhira over the dunya, that's going to change your value judgments dramatically in some cases, dramatically. Because once again, a rational self-interested actor is one who doesn't really care about altruism, right? This is something that's explicitly mentioned. Altruism, giving charity for the sake of a higher cause is not a part of rational economic rationality, right? Within Islam though, if you believe in the basic you know, principles of what being a Muslim is, this is how you get into paradise, through acts of charity. This is irrational. This is irrational behavior from, a, from the classical economic model. This is totally irrational. While liberalism, Islam values certain things social justice, they may value uh, a, a certain notion of freedom and rights, 
the way they're conceptualized in the language which is filtered is very different. And this definitely shapes the way we understand and what these limits are. How do you explain um, the different types of liberalisms? I mean, I mean, often I would imagine many of my listeners would, uh, would, would be somewhat confused about uh, how you're using the word liberalism. Um, so, for example, in, in America, you know, the word liberal is now seen to be, a, at least in part of the country, a, a, um, uh, often used as a term of abuse. Uh, it's a way of describing people who uh, have, um, have moderated their opinions to, to such a progressive level that they've, they've accepted uh, uh, things which the conservative right will find uh, unacceptable. So are those conservatives in America less liberal is America less liberal when uh, when it comes to, for example, under Donald Trump? Could we argue that America uh, moved away from liberalism? Um, uh, across Europe, we see different versions of liberalism. So in France, we've got a very assertive liberalism about French Muslims and how they're forced to, to give up uh, aspects of their deen in order to uh, buy into the liberal society. But also we've got, you know, very softer versions of liberalism. I mean, you know, in many ways... Uh, the the types of the constitutionalism, the rationality, the the break with the past, these these radical ideas that came from John Locke, uh, an English philosopher, ha- hasn't really been accepted by uh, large numbers of British uh, British people. We still have you know an established church in Britain, and we still we don't even have a written constitution in in, in Britain, and and you know the, the basic qualities of limited government probably don't exist and hasn't existed in Britain for for. Uh, uh, ever actually, uh, how do we uh, work out what liberalism is? Well, okay, for the America question, you know, America is very unique in this regard. Where it uses the term totally incorrectly, right? So, like, what the, what are called liberals in America primarily are social democrats or socialists, even, right? And what would normally be conservatives, normally under like the normal, like say Bush years, sort of, would be like more actually what liberalism, neoliberalism would be about right so these are classical liberals yeah these are more more of what classical liberalism is about even though that's not actually fully accurate either actually the probably the best example of what a real classical liberal would be in the american sense or certain like real like libertarian so for example something like i don't know if you know adam bates is you ever follow adam bates adam bates is an interesting guy and uh i still i completely disagree with libertarianism because i just find it to be a I think in a contemporary world, libertarianism is just an excuse to justify white supremacy for most people. But Adam Bates is not one of those. Adam Bates really believes in it. So the kind of stuff he stands for of limited government, maximization of individual rights and freedoms, this is probably the closest thing to what Locke and genuine liberalism is like that the original intent people of the libertarian party, not this new sort of Trumpian libertarianism, which is more of a type of nationalism that almost borders on fascism. But uh, yeah, Trumpism absolutely, I would say, is not a, an iteration of liberalism at all. It's something very different. Mm. And, uh, it is, is it a response to liberalism? It's a response to liberalism, absolutely. I would say that it is a response to the prevailing liberal norms. So even though Americans keep seem to call the call you know the system wrong, like it's the norms, the ideas, the basic principles have been yeah. It's a reaction to the failures of um, so the shortcomings of liberal of globalization of neoliberal governance, it's all been a big response. It's been a reaction to it. And this is why two of the leading candidates up until uh, the very end were really Bernie Sanders, who represented one sort of extreme within the Democratic Party, and and Trump, who was the other extreme, right? But the Democrats in the end, uh, at least in 2016, went with the more moderate, and then the Republicans went all the way, and it it, it worked. And uh, in 2020, again, Bernie Sanders came quite close. It was, I think, you know, until South Carolina, when things really changed in favor of Biden, you know, it looked like Bernie Sanders might pull it off this time. So, like, we do see that the, the failings of liberalism in, in the United States and in the West has led to backlashes. And uh, we can see the backlash is even more dramatic in parts of Europe, I think, than the United States. I think Trump, I think Trump was is, is a unique anomaly in some ways, but it is the continuation of a certain type of logic. So, the, tr- the reason Trump, the character, was able to assume power is partially because of the media empire he built for himself, his fame on the TV show that he, uh, the, the, the um, what's that show, the, the Apprentice, that everybody watched. Uh, my grandmother watched it, my mother, my father, the whole family. It was like something they did, and you know, it was sort of like being brainwashed into this big, powerful businessman who ran the, sh- who was like this intelligent leader with all this money and power. And 
you know, that's 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 a vision that many Americans want for themselves. They want that. So, you know, they see that as representative of the American dream, so to speak, coming true. And yeah, there's a backlash against, you know, the social justice movement to some extent. For some people, it's gone too far. And um, well, I, I do agree, typical American isn't ready for transgenderism. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a confusing construct that many Americans simply are not comfortable with. And I don't think it's gonna be, it's, it's moving too fast, in my opinion. Okay, it's moving too fast, and I think it's going to result in more backlash. I, I think in the end, it's not. It's, it's going to be a real tense, tense, stress-filled uh, this this next battleground, but on, on this issue, right? It took long enough. I mean, it took quite a long time for LGBT to gain acceptance, but I think the transgenderism is is moving at lightning speed right now. The, the, the movement to normalize it, and it's going to lead to a backlash, and it opens up the door for people like Trump. And others who speak in strongman tones about preserving the the American values, whatever the heck those actually are, right? And um, it, it 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 sort of uh, emboldens reactionaries and people to be, be violent and and disruptive, yeah. And that's what we saw sort of on the uh, on January sixth. You know, a lot of people are willing to fight and potentially even die for a man who, quite honestly, is the antithesis of everything. That the Bible talks about, that the Bible that most of these people reference is justifying why they're Republicans in the first place, right? And when you look at the hypocrisy of how this all plays out. Okay, let's switch to liberalism uh, and its problems. So what do you see to be the, the key problem with uh, liberalism today? The deeper root of this is a dissatisfaction with the liberal social order. It hasn't worked, right? Societies have become, societies themselves have become disconnected, right? These are the critiques of the communitarians. This is the stuff McIntyre talks about. This is the stuff that we see Charles Taylor. You know, the society has sort of lost a sense of purpose. What is the purpose? And when it all comes down to radical individualism, uh, you know, worldly maximization of short-term temporary happiness, you can have a, a, an unpleasant society, and it's going to lead to backlash. And this is the problem, in my opinion, with liberalism more generally, is that it, 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 it lacks moderation. Right, it, it it really does sort of lead, in my opinion, without proper checks to sort of to solipsism. Right, it's the world's about me and making me happy. And when you lose the perspective of what Allah's plan is for us, right, it's so talking as a Muslim here, losing that idea, look, looking at our sources and understanding why the Prophet taught his followers to act in certain ways and to not do certain things. And we can see all this, and we can look at the way the world is operating today, and we can see that, like, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of wisdom in all of this stuff. And we need to be careful, right? The world isn't about immediate self-pleasure. Sometimes we have to suffer a little bit. Sometimes we have to do things we don't want to do. And, um, you know, I think that's something that um, increasingly is becoming more apparent. And, and it, it, it's, it's, America's really messed up right now. I mean, uh, how far do you see the project of um, of liberals like Francis Fukuyama, who, uh, as you know, you know, famously said after the end of the Cold War that uh, we're now uh, we we're now entering a new era, uh, an end of history where um, uh, liberalism is 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 going to reign supreme and and other isms have been defeated. Uh, is that project truly over, or or is there a um, you know, he, he, I mean, when you hear Francis Fukuyama today, I mean, he's not an eating humble pie, is he? I mean, he he um, um, he believes that it's just going to take a little bit longer, but the project is 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 going to uh, bear some fruit at some point. Um, I mean, how do you how do you see uh, the Fukuyamas and 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 the others who've who've promised this uh, this land of milk and honey? Yeah, he he uh, came to Bosnia a couple of years ago. I believe it was twenty seventeen. He spoke at the University of Sarajevo. A packed auditorium, and uh, he, he addresses a little bit, and sort of as you said, it's it's a you know, it's too early to tell kind of thing, right? Like the, the Chow and Lai response to Nixon, right? You know, it's too early to say whether it's going to happen or not. And so yeah, he didn't sort of admit to being wrong. He just said it's all a part of this longer process, and he was wrong about the speed of the process. But it's going to all play out teleologically when the time comes. So you know, we just got to go through these ups and downs for the next however many years. And then eventually we'll end in this sort of end of ideology kind of thing where we all sort of embrace some kind of liberalism. And, and that, that's a that's a, a very uh, 
you know, anybody can make an argument like that that has no empirical verifiability. And I could say the world will all be following the Quran and Sharia at some point, because if you follow the Islamic eschatology, that sort of is the argument, right? There will be a point where the whole world will be Muslim. So I can make this claim as well and just say, well, we're just not there yet. And of course, nobody would accept that. They would say, you're, I'm crazy, I'm an extremist, I'm, I'm a fundamentalist. But once again, the double standard. If you're, if you're gonna make this argument about liberalism, I don't think anybody's calling him a dogmatist or an extremist outside certain small circles, right? Within popular, within polite academia, it's still a, va a viable argument that doesn't get you blacklisted as being a crazy man, right? So like, yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any verifiability to that. I don't, if anything, we're seeing some real retrenchment in liberal values throughout Europe right now, the rise of right-wing parties, the rise of reactionary thought, the rise of racism, ethnocentrism, xenophobia, Islamophobia, you name it, it's, it's there, and, and anti-Semitism as well. Let's not forget that, you know, anti-Semitism is still rampant in Europe and in the United States. So we see a lot of this kind of, the cosmopolitanism that liberalism seems to the value, the enlightenment values of cosmopolitanism and progressivism are, have, we've seen a major retrenchment. And let's be honest, this, this COVID uh, pandemic doesn't help <laughs> open anybody's mind to having more immigrants or new ways of life, right? You know, I, I, I just, when he gave the talk, you know, it was very, it was very erudite talk. He's obviously given it more than once. A lot of references, a lot of direct quotes. But I, I left feeling like, you know, this argument of it's too early to tell, just wait and see, be patient, is something that anybody can say about any ideology. You can say that about fascism, you can say about communism, you can say about anything. Like, wait and see is not a, and it, all the evidence we see is pointing sort of the contrary. We're seeing, if anything, <laughs> a rise in sort of the situation, we're sort of entering the 1930s again, or 1920s, 1930s, rather than getting into some era of post ideology, right? So I think, but once again, Fukuyama sort of built his whole brand on this argument. It's sort of hard to throw in the garbage can. If, you know, and most people aren't willing to do what Wittgenstein did and say, well, I was wrong. Let me try this new argument instead. And I'm going to write this book just proving my last one. Like, that takes a certain kind of person to do that. So I wouldn't expect him to totally re to recant his arguments. But I think what he did is probably the most sensible thing you could have expected out of a Stanford, Hoover Institution fellow whose whole career has been based on this pretty much as one major book right and 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 in your book you when you discuss uh, the compatibility of islam with liberalism um you you cite um examples in in our history uh, going back right to you know to the 19th century when the ottomans uh first had to engage seriously with the west and its fault and uh, many ottoman subjects uh, were seduced, I suppose, by uh, aspects of modernity and, 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 and some of them embraced aspects of liberalism. Can, can you talk us through uh, this first encounter, I suppose, between Muslims and, and liberalism and, and what was the impact of that disaster during the Ottoman period? Well, you know, as anyone who has a rudimentary understanding of Ottoman history knows, the, the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman state went through a long period of decline. And by the uh, early 19th century, there was, it was clear that reforms needed to be made. I mean, it, it simply was falling behind. You know, the, the Western liberal model had been better at accumulating capital, had been better at, you know, you could read Timur Kuran's work where he discusses this. You don't have to agree with everything he says because some of the things he says are quite contentious. But I think there's a, a, a ring of truth to a lot of what he says. And certain reforms had to be made. And you see the Tanzimat reforms that happened over the uh, 1839. And then the certain there's many things that sort of allowed for the you know, individual freedoms to be more recognized of, of minority subjects. And this reform has happened over a period of about 40 years, to my knowledge. But when you look at certain people like Namek Kemal and the Young Turks movement, they were certainly influenced by liberal ideas, right? Kemal, for example, is particularly significant for his championing of the notions of freedom, liberal idea, and his idea of fatherland, which is also something that is definitely connected to liberalism as well, this idea of the nation state, right? And um, you could see this throughout his plays and poems and other writings. It had a major impact on the rise of Turkish nationalism, a phenomenon that the Frankfurt School members have argued that itself is um, dependent upon Enlightenment liberal ideas. You couldn't have nationalism, couldn't have fascism without the Enlightenment, right? This is the Adorno argument. And Kemal is often regarded as being instrumental in defining Western concepts like natural rights, natural rights and uh, constitutional governments within an Islamic reform-minded discursive framework. His focus on national loyalty rather than loyalty to a monarch, right? Uh, you know, is a very 
liberal kind of formulation, right? So we see people, you know, not all the Young Turk, the whole movement wasn't all secular. There were some Muslims, religious people too at the beginning, then towards the end it became what came, right? So this whole movement uh, was definitely influenced by liberalism and liberal ideas. And, you know, it, when, when your empire is in, in, in decline and collapse, as, as the Ottoman was for, for quite some time, uh, you, you're going to look to other places for ideas, right? The intellectuals, that's what intellectuals do. They look for answers to solutions and or solutions to problems. And, uh, you know, looking towards the West where things seem to be going better at that time was only made sense, right? And, uh, you know, the earlier people in these movements did want to maintain sort of an Islamic tone to these reforms. But as time went on, started seeing the more secular, rejecting the Khalifa started becoming more mainstream to be entered in the early 20th century. So like, uh, and of course we can think of other reform-minded movements that happened in the 19th and 20th century within Islam that emphasized freedom of expression, freedom of dissent, and sort of a, a breaking away from ossified institutions that were not really functioning as they should. Uh, with Kharadin Pasha, right? We could think of, uh, you know, Muhammad Abdu to some extent, Afghani, all these people clearly had some there's something that liberalism gave them that influenced their minds, right? And why did liberalism have such an impact on uh, these young Turks and uh, these um, uh, Ottoman Muslims? I think it's important to remember that ideas don't develop on vacuums, right? Ideas interact with other ideas. So all societies, all traditions are based on things that they got from other traditions as well, right? So even within early Islam, right, after the, after the Prophet, peace, blessings be upon him, you know, the, the, a lot of the ideas for governance came from Persian Persia, right? The, the administrative practices of the Persian Empire were, were superior to what the Arabs had, and they, they borrowed a lot of that. So this idea that, you know, uh, you know it, it shouldn't be surprising that liberal ideas would influence Muslims and Muslim reformers, and even Muslim traditionalists to some degree for that matter. And it shouldn't be surprising that uh, certain Islamic ideas at some point could also influence liberal ideas. However, I don't think that is going to, I think that it's more of a one-way street at this point because the one discourse is so much further entrenched and, and, and powerful. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely hard to deny that liberalism shaped modern Islamic thinking and modern Islamic political thought, modern Islamic sociological thought, and, and maybe even the religion itself to some extent, as it was practiced by jurists and whatnot. I mean... You know, I'm, you could look at uh, Sami Ayyub's book about Egypt, right? It's uh, the jurists in Egypt and the codification of law there. And there's a couple other books on that. And uh, I think uh, clearly the liberal ideas that were permeating found their way into this, right? The world had become different. And simply put, the nation state had, had disrupted the way things had operated. The rise of the nation state forced change upon the Muslim world. And, you know, that 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 is really... An undeniable fact, right? How far do you believe Islamic thought today is, uh, in many ways, a response to liberalism? Whether that's conservatives, conservative thought, or whether that's you know, people like Mustafa Akio, how how much uh, are we developing our our religion as a response to liberalism? I think liberalism certainly is a fulcrum in which modern Islamic discourse, in many ways, hinges upon, which is problematic, obviously, as it is. Allowing another discourse to shape the way we operate. I mean, I just wrote a book on this, so obviously I'm a part of this to some extent. But we, you, you can't ignore the, the power, of the elephant in the room that is liberalism, and it needs to be engaged with, but in a critical and reasonable manner, right? We can't get overly emotive when engaging with this as well. And I've seen too many responses that I feel are that go overboard in, in demonizing liberalism and trying to portray it as something that it is not. And I think that is also counterproductive. We need to engage with these these concepts on their own terms. And we need to engage in what, once again, Andrew March, scholar who I have an immense amount of respect for, calls principled critical theory, or principled comparative theory, right? Engaged comparative political theorizing, which is like, a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an art in of itself and it, it goes beyond just rhetoric. It's, it's, a, it's, it's it has a methodology to it. And we need to engage with this kind of engaged <laughs> comparative political theorizing if we're gonna make inroads and understand discourses better and come up with solutions for problems. Because in the end, that's what it's about. It's about finding solutions to some of the problems because we can't deny that the Muslim world is in a, is in a pretty bad state right now. You know, if Muslims fighting amongst themselves, 
over the most minor of issues, things that shouldn't be causing such division, uh, scholars attacking each other in, in very crude ways, people making entire careers based on picking out faults and misstatements somebody might have made 10 years ago. I mean, it's, it's, it's really embarrassing. You know, at the same time, though, we see a lot of scholars that at one point were considered traditional and conservative sort of slowly morphing into something that is trying to be more accommodating to the liberal ideals. And, and that too is problematic. So I think that we see reaction from both sides. And it's, it's you know, as you get older, you, you but you know, another thing is, is a lot of the times this happens because as you get older, you know, you recognize you have to be able to play nice with everybody if you want your voice to be heard. You have to be able to be engage in, in respectful deliberation with people that you may be opposed to because otherwise you're just preaching to the choir, you know, arguing points that people want to hear who are clapping at everything you say makes you feel good, but you, you don't make real change in that regard. You make change by causing people to change. <laughs> so when you're telling people what they already want to hear, and then you get a pat on the back for it, I mean, what are you really doing? You're just speaking, it's an echo chamber, and it, that doesn't benefit anybody, right? So at some level, I do have respect for scholars that are willing to sort of I don't want to say give away their 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 position, but like to uh, we're willing to respectfully engage with those that hold a different position. But I think that they should still maintain you know the basic premises of what they stood for in the first place without trying to you know be overly accommodating where they lose their own their own unique position. You know. And, and let me ask you about you you uh, mentioned Dr. Andrew March there, and he he's written a book about Islam in in liberal citizenship and. Um, uh, he talks of an overlapping consensus and and um, you know concludes that uh, there are ways by which liberal society can accommodate Muslims and Muslims can accommodate a liberal society. I mean, how far do you buy that as a as an argument? Well, yes, I, I think his argument about um, you know Muslims living in non-Muslim societies is, is it holds pretty well. But I think, and he, he himself would agree, I think, that his book was written with that specific angle. It wasn't about non-Muslims living in Muslim societies. It's about Muslims living in non-Muslim societies, right? So when we talk about an overlapping consensus, we should be sort of clear on what the, what it means because the term is used a lot. I don't think people fully understand what it means. All right, so I'll just, I, I have like a note here. I just want to read it because it's that important not to screw this up. On an overlapping consensus, right? Rawls' famous notion suggested that this the supporters of differing yet reasonable comprehensive doctrines can still find common ground on certain principles of justice, so long as each comprehensive doctrine shared similar concerns as an authentic part of their original value system, right? Not a modus vivendi, right? Which we can talk about, which is sort of an agreement just for the sake of, uh, to avoid conflict. And quote, support a political conception of justice underwriting a constitutional democratic society whose principles, ideals, and standards satisfy the criterion of reciprocity, right? So this is another thing that I argue in the book, there's certain issues with reciprocity when it comes to Islam and, and uh, non-Muslims and non-Muslim subjects, right? You know, once again, we look at the, this idea of free speech and this idea of defaming the prophet, right? The, the pictures that keep coming up in my... I, I don't see how any authentically Islamic society could allow for defaming images of the prophet to be freely passed around without some repercussions. I don't see how there, there could be certain practices and behaviors that are accepted in Western societies that would be able to be freely practiced in the Muslim world, in a, in a truly Islamic society, an Islamic governed state, if you want to use the term I used in my first book. And so the principle of reciprocity is, is, is sort of problematic. And I, I also think that. Um, you know, when we look at overlapping consensus, the key word here is an authentic part, right? So it's not just making an agreement for the sake of avoiding conflict. It's about finding genuine overlapping consensuses. And indeed, there, there probably are certain elements that you can find an overlapping consensus with. But I think in general, when looking at the second order problem, the higher order issues, there's some major um, major dis disagreements and major different understandings. That's something that needs to be considered. And that's what my book really tries to focus in on that we should understand these lower order commonalities as being incidental rather than indicative. It's incidental to rather than generally indicative of an actual congruency between the discourses. You talked about the, there may be some incidental uh, overlaps between liberalism and Islam. And what are you referring to there? Well, I, I think the way we see the, uh, you know, the concern with human rights, right? There, there's an overlap on that. 
But I think the, what it's rooted in, right, is different, right? Human reason, human human understanding of what those rights are based on the UDHR, you know, you, you, the Declaration of Human Rights. That's sort of like the, the liberal understanding where they derive from, right? They come, we, we come out with, through reason. And for Muslims, human rights are understood as, as a part of Allah's divine will, right? As we, we, we understand that through the Sharia, through Quran, through Sunnah, uh, through Hadith, right? And, and, and yes, we sort of reach a similar conclusion, but when you find out where the sources came from, it's a, big, it's a very different place, which shows that there is overlap between human reason and Islam's foundational sources. And this is something, if you look at, you know, like even Taymiyyah, they, they argued this, that you can partially derive morality based on your own free will, but you need the Quran and the Sunnah to fully get it right. So without those sources, you can't really understand things properly. So you're not completely, like, if you didn't have it, you'd be lost and you'd be murdering people because you would be so confused, you know? You have a basic, inkling of this divine will in your 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 fitra right your your who you are born as but it's through the quran and the sunnah that we can perfect that we can fine tune that and become generally moral subjects right so we're, we're built with the capacity to understand this stuff and we're built with certain inclinations towards what is good and what is bad we have a natural disposition so that's that would be one example i would say where you sort of Started two very different starting points, but you ended a sort of similar conclusion. And I think we can find a lot of those, if, but I don't think I have time to go into all of the different uh, examples of I, that. I come across a lot of Muslims who study politics and, and philosophy at university. And, and of course, we, we, we tend to uh, find the, the classical forms of liberalism of John Locke or John Stuart Mill and, you know, the, the capitalist theories of Adam Locke to be somewhat very problematic. And, and you know, um, we... We we uh, we wince at that rugged uh, individualism that comes from those early days of of liberalism. However, uh, liberalism has gone through um, a series of iterations, and uh, a, a number of Muslims who study these disciplines they warm to the ideas of uh, of modern liberals like John Rawls, who who calls for a type of liberalism which I suppose is is more in line with some Islamic values of community and justice and. And, you know, John Rawls talks, uh, you know, pr probably quite sincerely about um, uh, the, you know, the inequalities that exist in society and, and the need to address, uh, you know, these, uh, these uh, the byproducts of, of liberalism and, or the, the failures of liberalism head on. Um, I mean, would you say that the, this sort of John Rawlsian version of liberalism is, is at least more tolerable to uh, the type of Islam that you and I may may practice. Yes, absolutely. I mean, this is, I think, Muhammad Fadl's argument as well is that basically, you know, Islam and comprehensive liberalism, you know, they're 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 pretty different. But I think he one of the things he really tries to do throughout his works is to show the compatibilities in the in the uh, the overlap between Rawlsian liberalism and Islam, and. Uh, you know he 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 writes very eloquently, and he's I think he's an, an amazing scholar. I really enjoy his work because it's very rigorous, and his his access to primary sources and his knowledge of you know Islamic law is is is, is amazing. But I, I think at the same time he does sort of offer a specific kind of Islam that fits within that interpretation, right? And I think his the the, the kind of Islam he's discussing a lot does it does hinge upon sort of progressive interpretations of certain doctrine or sort of things that are about reform, sort of reform oriented things that might go outside the traditional, the traditional understanding of certain matters. So yeah, Rawlsian liberalism, um, you know, it, it claims to be a neutral arbiter in terms in these affairs, right? That it doesn't care about your, your religious background, right? It's about deliberating from this original position, right? So when you look at the whole beginning of Rawls' theory, it's about Sort of mutual mutual self dis mutual disinterest, I guess, of the other person, and you're arguing from a um, you're arguing basically from your own rational self interest based in this world, right? So you're you're, you're getting rid of all your wor other worldly and psychological attachments. You're you're, you're deliberating a generic being, right? That's a generic being that doesn't really have a history, right? And this is sort of problematic on many levels because Muslims do have a history. And they do have foundational sources. Once again, we can't, as a Muslims, cut ourselves off from our tradition. We can't do that because they're once again, it, it, it doesn't work. So, uh, and, and you know, the, I, the, the the quote from Bihu Park, right, about uh, you know liberalism itself 
is a transformative project. And while you know the thing with Rawlsian liberalism is it still ultimately re requires transformation. It requires you eventually giving up that position unless you can articulate it in some kind of way that is conducive to the requirements of public reason, right? And then we see Habermas has something, has an institutional translation proviso, I believe it's called. And this is the same kind of thing is that you can come into the deliberative process arguing rooted in a comprehensive doctrine, but at some point you got to find a non-religious reason to justify your claim. And you know that that that's something that uh, for for you know, is he talking about constitutional essentials? The question is: Is Rawls talking about constitutional essentials only? Is he talking about all forms of deliberation? And you know, if you look closely at Rawls, it's not clear exactly what the answer to that is. But uh, even if you give him that he's only talking about constitutional essentials, there's still certain constitutional essentials that an Islamic society would uh, you know would hinge upon <laughs> engaging in discourse and deliberation that is rooted in revealed sources and in, in, in prior texts, in, in prior rulings, right? So like, can this be done? And I argue sort of, I, I don't think it can. And that's what I'm trying to make the point throughout my book is this is a tough sell. And I don't think it's really feasible. Uh, often I, I find that liberalism, uh, it's, its selling point is that it um, it believes in toleration. And if you read Mustafa Akio and, and he he criticizes uh, Muslim countries, but also countries like India under a, a rabid nationalism or Hindu nationalism. You have the persecution of Muslims or Myanmar. And I suppose the argument is that only liberalism can negotiate the different versions of good of, of the good life in a in a given society. And so you could be a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist and you can thrive in a liberal society, but no one uh, system of belief is going to uh, suppress another system of belief, and um, um, uh, you know th this. Although you know we we challenge liberalism, uh, the the idea, the idea really has um, you know has uh, gained some currency, especially since we see the failure of Muslim countries. I mean, just think about the number of Christians and Jews that are left in the Arab world, and uh, the you know the uh, uh, the almost uh, ethnic cleansing, I suppose, of, of you know, certain communities that are not uh, Muslim or not a certain type of Muslim um, in, in, in these countries. I mean, how would you, how would you uh, um, address uh, that whole toleration idea that comes from liberalism? Well, I mean, you know, liberal toleration in the end is tolerant only of other liberal ideas. We, we've seen this when, when something comes up that goes against the principles and norms of what liberalism, liberals, liberalism's understanding of free speech, liberalism's understanding of gender norms, and then it's not, not tolerated anymore, right? And I, I don't think this is a real mystery, and I think this is really one of the biggest uh, sort of problems with the liberal discourse more generally is that it still has its limits, and its limits are w rooted within the larger comprehensive liberal doctrine. So Rawlsian public reasoning, Rawlsian political liberalism itself is still dependent upon the ontology of comprehensive liberalism. And I, I can't go into all the details about that because it's in my book. I do talk about that. And that, that would be a very complex discussion that I, I, I couldn't properly articulate right now. No, in reality, uh, you know, I, when you have a political liberalist doctrine that is, it is dependent upon comprehensive liberal values to some extent, and that is problematic. And um, when we get to, I spend a good part of the book talking about this, that in the end, despite its claims to be neutral arbiter, it, it's, it still isn't, right? And um, this idea that other societies can't be tolerant. I mean, you know, why is it always that within an Islamic society, the argument is that the, the, the Islamophobes make, and, and even reformer Muslim liberals, is that these societies are just hopelessly unable to accommodate for any kind of pluralism. Like, this is craziness. The Ottoman Empire had multiple different faith traditions living within it under relative peace. You saw this in Al-Andalus as well. Like, why is it, why have Muslims accepted this, this, this narrative imposed upon us that we have a religion that doesn't tolerate any dissent? You must, in an Islamic society, be exactly what we say, and if not, it's to the, to the you know, we're going to hang you, and, or we're going to cut your head off, right? And this is sort of, like, wrong, because historically, we've seen a lot of toleration and a lot of pluralism in these societies. And it's possible to live a meaningful life as a minority in an Islamic society that and we can look back historically at multiple examples of this. 
So yes, if you're going to be a minority in an Islamic society, you're going to have certain limits, just like any minority in any society, in a liberal society as well, right? You know, not everybody has equal access to power. We have to accept that. That's just a fact of life, right? And an Islamic society is going to operate on Islamic values and Islamic principles. But that doesn't mean that those who are not, don't hold them, can't have some access to the public sphere or to the deliberative process on certain matters, because most matters in daily life aren't Sharia focused. You know, matters of administration and daily policy, there's a lot of room for deliberation and disagreement on that, right? And, uh, you know, there's, uh, we all know that there's certain exemptions and, and uh, privileges that non Muslims have, anyways. They can do certain things within the context of their religious traditions that Muslims can't do. So I, I think more research on this can be done and more people can start to articulate this more clearly because. Once again, it's it's a game of the narrative. The narrative being spread sent is that liberalism is allows for toleration and dissent and difference. And the Islam, you know, you can't do any of that. You have to sort of just obey and do what you're told. And in reality, that neither of those narratives are accurate. And once again, it's about who's controlling how we're understanding these terms. And in my last book, I sort of talked about that the problem with Islamic governance is the term has been redefined by those who are against it. And they paint a picture of it as something bad and scary, right? And those who are in favor of it have not done as good of a job in, re- in, in controlling the discourse on what the term itself even means, what it refers to. Sadly, it doesn't refer to much of anything. It's such a broad term that it, it can refer to everything ranging from ISIS to whatever is going on right now in Turkey. Like, there's no, like, there's no set set of principles that, that constrain it. And when you have something like that that's sort of amorphous and all over the place, then you got people that are very trained, very professional people like Robert Spencer and Pamela Geller and others who are better than her, obviously, because she's not even really good at this. But these people really can do a good job of pigeonholing this stuff and, and, and nailing that into people's heads as what it is. And that ends the discussion, right? And that's bad. In your book, you, you talk about the Muslim world and you say it remains illiberal, yet the West wants to graft liberalism onto these societies, which you argue will ultimately fail. But if we were to take a look at examples of the Muslim world today, like Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, there seems to be, at least uh, from from where I'm sitting, uh, a general fervor uh, in that society, especially amongst young people, to uh, to accept and embrace some of uh, some liberal ideals. Um, just think about Saudi Arabia and and the the reforming in inverted commas, uh, you know. Uh, uh, agenda of uh, of the crown prince and 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 the need to and the want or the desire to um, uh, to bring in uh, Western forms of culture and and to, to break some of the uh, the gender strict gender um, uh, um, uh, separation or segregation that that existed in the country for for a long time. I mean that's that's been wildly embraced. It seems by by many young people. Iran is another example of that. You know, you've got a growing movement. Of of those who who despise or dislike uh, the the strength of the of the so called mullahs, uh, I mean, you know, is is it true that the Muslim world is is somehow uh, impervious to these uh, to these changes in in uh, uh, in liberalization in liberalizing our, our our communities? Well, I mean, we have to look at what what do we mean by liberalizing, right? So by allowing people to go to movies and drive cars. That isn't really the essence of liberalism because the real test of liberal toleration is in free speech and in political speech at that. And in, in both of the societies you mentioned, that is not an option, especially in Saudi Arabia, especially in Saudi Arabia. So like, uh, you know, how, how serious, they, as I say in my book, they're paying lip service to liberal reforms and they're throwing a few crumbs out there that are going to please the masses. And, you know, people go to movies now and people can listen to music, but like the real test of liberal toleration is in, public speech and in free speech and in public forms of expression. And that still isn't really happening. And I don't think that's going to happen. And yeah, I mean, you know, when you look at societies that are rep- overly repressive, that are not functioning very well, there's a lot of problems and people are going to be more open towards um, change. They're going to be, they're going to want to see something different. And, you know, that this is the danger as I argue about states that define themselves as Islamic states or Islamic governed states. If you screw it up, you're going to run people away from religion altogether. And this is what's really happened in Iran, to be honest, is there's a lot of people who are no longer religious because things have gone so poorly. And, uh, you know, this is why it's important to focus on good, sound administration and policy rather than sloganeering. 
because these slogans do nothing but alienate people and anger them. And then they start to identify the state with the religion. If the state failed, that means religion failed. And that means I don't want to be a part of it. And I, I really, I always make this point to people that, you know, it, it's so important that, you know, if you're going to take up the mantle of Islam, you better do it right. Because if you screw it up, you're going to not only damage your state, you're going to damage people's souls. You're going to damage people's faith in the deen. And you're doing a major disservice to the religion itself. And I, I think that uh, this is why it's important to be cautious and careful when creating new modes of social organization and trying to call them Islamic, because if it doesn't go right, it can really be a problem. And so, yeah, I mean, people right now, they're, they're, they have embraced some of the reforms in Saudi Arabia that have sort of liberalized certain aspects of society. But, the, you know, there are many authoritarian states in the world today that allow for these basic things that are going on in Saudi Arabia and Iran. More so, more so Saudi Arabia we're talking about exactly right now with the recent liberalization of certain, you know, very minor, mundane, daily things. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the failures of the Arab revolutions, the, uh, the, the, the failures of global economy, of, of the Muslim world's economic situations, you know, it, it's going to lead to people seeking new ideas. But I don't think these are going to all work out because there's still a very traditionalist undercurrent within both of these – within Saudi Arabia more so than Iran because I think Iran is a more secular-minded country anyways. I've been there. I, I understand the culture pretty well. And there are religious people there, but there's also a lot of people that are not. And I think – I don't know Saudi culture as well. But from what I've gathered from most people I've spoken with is the religion is still pretty serious and it's still take by – people in general, especially older generation. And uh, it just, you know, people are looking for answers to their daily economic problems, their daily lack of comfort, their lack of opportunities. And, you know, I make the point that economic development is important. If you don't have societies that develop functioning economies that offer people jobs, you're not going to have a successful state. And Muslim societies don't make stuff, right? They, they sell mineral, there's a rentier states. You can look that up if you don't know what it is, but basically a rentier state the state that collects rents through things like oil and other mineral resources. They don't produce anything. They just sell their oil gets, and then it gets refined abroad and sold, uh, you know, back to these states in many cases. And, uh, you know, this isn't a good way to run your economy. You need diversified economy. You need local industries. Entrepreneurship is essential and it's very much lacking in much of the Muslim world, right? Like, like entrepreneurship that actually in engages with large industry, that engages with having creating industries locally with local people working on them. So, you know, it, uh, the problem is, is that's not really been fostered. And uh, there's no reason that, you know, the Arab world can't manufacture automobiles or airplane parts or other things that we see that are manufactured in the United States and in Canada and in other places like that. So I really think the economic development is, is essential and I think it's been neglected. So when you have this these competing sort of ways of understanding the world, like an autocratic state, rentier state, and then you try to thrust liberal ideas on it, you can have a mess. You have a lot of confused people who don't know what the heck's going on. And uh, that's sort of what you're seeing right now, I think, in Saudi Arabia. I don't know what's going to happen there. It's, it's going to be very interesting. It's a, it's really a, a work in progress. It's a, it's a laboratory for analysis of what happens when you implement, you know, sort of over the night shock liberal reforms. And, and one final question, Dr. Um, Kaminsky. I, I've, um, uh, I'm interested in your in your take on what's happening here in the UK. Um, we've seen in this past week a, a teacher um, showed the cartoons from uh, the uh, Charlie Hebdo or, or Gillen's post in one of these papers, um, one of these magazines of the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam in, uh, in you know in in a very uh, you know, which has very negative connotations, of course, and 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 links Muslims to terrorism and 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 other misdeeds. And um, uh, there's been a series of protests outside the school, and and uh, uh, Muslim parents are are pretty angry about it. But the backlash from uh, from wider society has been in, in, intense. Even even moderate commentators who, who normally take a very strong line against Islamophobia. Uh, have come out uh, stressing the need for freedom of speech and how Muslims uh, really are um, uh, uh, should not uh, should not be demonstrating against what is essentially academic freedom. Um, I mean, do you see this as a 
as an example, you know, a, a mini example of this, of this incompatibility between liberalism and Islam. And, and if so, how, how do Muslims navigate around this far more assertive form of liberalism that we, especially in Europe, uh, are facing, you know, in, in, you know, over these past few years? With strength. With strength. In, in my opinion, Muslims need to engage with this strongly. They should be out protesting. Freedom of speech is a two-way street. This guy in the UK can say whatever he wants, right, legally. Why can't Muslims then protest this, right? Why should Muslims just accept this without having some kind of uh, outcry or some kind of, uh, you know, repercussion? I, I, I think that this is exactly the problem we discussed here is this is the, this, this, this hypocrisy of toleration that, that it's, you know, people have basically made the argument that the whole notion of toleration, especially in free speech, is just a way to allow for people to harass and say nasty things about Muslims because there are limitations and restrictions of what other people can say about other people. So you can't say certain things about the queen, you can't say certain things about Jews, right? And it seems like the only person, the people who the free speech rule applies to are, are, are specifically to the Muslims and to Muslim figures. And, uh, you know, Muslims need to use the free speech to their benefit, protest and let people make it un, make it difficult boycott these people's products do things you know when you know i think it was good when, after macron made his you know most recent offensive comments people throughout the arab world started boycotting french products and he backed off a little bit if you paid attention he sort of walked back what he said this is use the power of the purse right this is a good way to get get things done and liberal societies is to break out their products you know nike and all these companies in the united states re respond to this stuff because when you start attacking the checkbook that's how you make real change you know and you know i i think you know a violent response is not the answer to this because it's just going to result in every teacher showing <laughs> disrespectful images it's going to backfire and, but there are ways to forcefully and strongly voice your discontent with something that don't go into violence and, and that's why muslims need to organize and come up with ways to hold these people accountable and uh i, I don't think that muslims should this is not about you know it's just it's, it's not just about free speech and i i think this is really the double standard has to be called out and it's, it's time to start making it more clear that we know what you're doing everybody knows what's going on you know, if this was some kind of cartoon mocking the Holocaust or a gas chamber, it would have been condemned and the teacher would have been fired immediately, right? So we know that there's double standards on this. Uh, we know that in France, too, that the comedian, I can't remember his name, uh, it starts with letter D, Duodene or whatnot, he went to jail for a few months for making anti-Semitic uh, comedy routine, right? Isn't that something? This guy went to jail for comments he made in a comedy routine about Jews. And on the other hand, showing offensive images of the Prophet Muhammad, of the Prophet Muhammad, is, is somehow seen as free speech, and there's, there's, there's no punishment for that. Now, that particular case, there are some, there are a lot of things going on in that case. There's a, that's that's far more complicated than I think the media has led on. I think that, uh, you know, when you understand what really happened in that case, it was a tragedy. I think the teacher was made it clear that he was trying not to be disrespectful. I still don't think he should have done it. But it wasn't meant to antagonize the kids and it was sort of a you know he said she said kind of thing and somebody from totally outside ends up committing an atrocity right but once again like this is like when you antagonize a minority people by offending their most sacred figures like, this is this, this is the kind of thing you have to expect could happen whether it's right or wrong isn't the point there has to be some logic and reason people get offended and when you do this understanding how people have responded in the past it, it, you're just creating a situation where you're putting yourself in a position of a uh, problem and it doesn't need to be done right does it need to be do it? is there a way to have this lesson without actually showing the offensive images is there a way to do it culturally in a sensitive manner and of course there is right but when you see what like i said the british case specifically the thing that's going on right now i mean i i just don't think it was necessary and it is just antagonism and um this is the kind of thing that in a in a muslim society i think there would be repercussions for you you couldn't do this kind of thing and uh that's something that I, you know, I don't think it's going to change anytime soon in the minds of most Muslims. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. Once you, you know, once you, once you allow the figure and the person of the prophet to be insulted and demeaned, you really start to take away from the whole religion itself. The religion starts to become reified. It becomes commodified. And I actually quoted in one of my articles, uh, 
what's his name? The guy who was murdered by uh, Steph Charbonnet, Charbonnet, I believe his name was, the, the editor Charlie Hebdo. He gave an interview and I, in, in an article I published about Islam and imagery in the journal Social Compass in 2019, I talked, or 2020 it came out actually, I talked about this. He talked about his whole purpose was to mock Islam until it came became as banal as Catholicism. Very interesting quote. To mock Islam until it becomes as banal as Catholicism. So indeed, he wasn't trying to make these images as for a cheap laugh or to even offer profound social commentary. It was an act of war against Islam. It was to mock it until it became so commonplace that it was just like making fun of the Pope or making fun of you know, a, a t-shirt with Jesus's picture on it, right? This was the goal, to mock Islam until it became just another who cares, which says something. It means that Islam still maintains a strong, there's a strong connection to the religion. People are willing to fight for it. There are still certain taboos in a religion, which in my opinion is a sign that the religion still has, is still, is still has viability. It's still alive. It's, people are willing to get upset when people stop caring. When people say, well, it's just, well, well, who cares? Then it shows that the religion has lost its, its, its power, its strength. You know, as a kid growing up, I remember, you know, I grew up in the United States, was mostly Christian. When I saw people wearing these t-shirts, Jesus is my homeboy, and other images of Jesus Christ, I thought, how could you wear this? Like, this is the man who supposedly died for your sins, right? This is the man who was crucified. This is the guy you believe is God. And uh, you're wearing a t-shirt that says, Jesus is my homeboy, with him wearing a backwards shirt and giving a thumbs up, like, like what kind of like what does that say about the state of the religion when people aren't offended and upset by that? So in my opinion, I think it's a good thing that Muslims are offensive or get offended and are defensive when this happens, because if they wouldn't, it would say something larger and more profound about the state of the religion itself. But indeed, like the Charlie Hebdo example is important because it shows these people know what they're doing. These people are fully aware of what they're doing when they give these lessons, when they're teaching about free speech. When they when they're they know who they're targeting and what the point they're trying to make is, and Muslims shouldn't play dumb about that. They should call that out, because if it was really a, uh, a lecture about free speech, then you would allow other offense. You you could use other offensive examples as well towards other groups, but clearly that wasn't done. Professor Joseph Kaminsky, it's really great to have spoken to you today, and um, I would advise everyone to to purchase this book if if they want to understand Islam and liberalism uh, further and. Um, I think it's it's a very uh, intelligent look at the subject, and uh, it really is is very much needed. So, thank you for uh, for your time today, and uh, I pray that um, the book has a uh, has an impact in in uh, the general discourse about the subject. And I thank you very much for giving me the time to uh, talk a little bit today. And like I said, it, it's hard to talk about these topics, and and because it's so complex, there's so many moving parts, and. If, if I sounded like a little bit cluttered today, read the book. I promise it'll read, it'll it'll make more sense than the way I sort of explain things. I just feel like when I lecture and talk, it's it's not as clear. I feel like my writing is a little bit more to the point. So I really recommend if there's anything you don't understand about what I said today, read the book. And I think it'll clarify any confusions you may have about what I was saying today. And thank you again for this really wonderful opportunity. This is my first public talk about the book. And uh, I, it's an honor to be on this program, particularly to have it.